Thank you, and good morning. OK, there we've got the first slide. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate the opportunity this morning of uh, talking about what I see and have been uh, making a number of presentations throughout the city is what I see as a serious conversation for all New Yorkers. And uh, my message is really about the power of using an interdisciplinary approach, using big data to formulating a response to natural disasters. Uh, you know, here in New York, two years ago, Hurricane Irene uh, was, was really a wake-up call to the whole New York area, and last year, Sandy, I think, was even more of a wake-up call, especially to Staten Island, the Rockaways, Breezy Point, uh, you know, other low-lying coastal areas. And I want to talk this morning about how big data analytics have helped us understand that event and how we might be able to, to prepare more for the future. And I'm the green button. Nothing's happening. Can we have the next slide? There we go. Whoops, go back one. OK, thank you. Uh, this, this slide on the left, uh, you can see, uh, you know, prior to big data analytics, the mapping that was done in the 1880s, uh, specifically on Staten Island. This is an 1897 map that shows some of the most damaged area from Hurricane Sandy. Back in the 1880s, that area was uh, below sea level. Uh, you can see, especially on the uh, the uh, south of the south shore of Staten Island, there are old marshes and dune fields and areas that were below sea level even then, and sea level is a, is a foot higher than it is today. In the center, uh, you can see our uh, uh, computer generation of the topography above sea level. The dark line on there is actually sea level, and then uh, really showing the seafloor bathymetry and the blue shades uh, uh, below sea level. And on the right, is uh, some of the mapping that we did uh, prior to Hurricane Sandy and some of the predictions that we did of, of what a storm surge might look like, and then superimposed on that is the actual damage from the Sandy event. And, and uh, you know, without getting into all the details of the field geology, what it shows is the most damaged houses were those that were built in the old tidal channels that you can see on the maps uh, from back in the uh, in the, in the 1800s. And again, sea level has been rising about a, about a foot a, a century. Uh, we think that New York is probably one of the most dangerous places on the entire eastern seaboard. And uh, what happens if you take the, if you just look on this map and you can see the roughly uh, north-south shore or the north-south shoreline of the Jersey Shore and the roughly east-west shoreline of Long Island, it forms a right angle that when a storm surge, which is really a bulge of water created by the low pressure zone of the hurricane, uh, wind piles water on top of that, tides raise the, all of that up, is that comes ashore, those right angles compress, not the water, but compress the bulge and really squirt it against the shore of Staten Island and, and up the New York Harbor. And that particular shoreline configuration is really unique on the entire uh, eastern seaboard, and so the New York Harbor sits in a, in a very uh, vulnerable uh, place. So, so for several years, I've been working with an interdisciplinary team using the City University of New York's High Performance uh, Computing Center, which is housed at the College of uh, Staten Island, and we've been using that to model how the surges might uh, impact uh, the New York area. And what you're seeing here on this simul is, is the actual meteorological conditions of the actual event of, of Hurricane Sandy. And so you can see that the, the track of how where Sandy did develop down in the Central Caribbean and then uh, made its way to, to really hitting the most vulnerable point of the eastern seaboard. So our uh, center at the College of Staten Island houses two of the latest generation uh, Cray supercomputers. Uh, we cover all of modern computational architecture. In uh, fact, uh, here uh, sitting in the front row are Mike Kress, who's the director of the center and vice president for economic de development. Ellen Benemoff is a researcher and field geologist, uh, along with our doctoral student, uh, Lairdon Seelan, 
who are all part of our interdisciplinary team. And I'm mentioning them, so if you have the tough questions at the break, they're the ones that you should, <laughs> that you should seek out. Uh, the College of Staten Island facility can ha handle massive amounts of data as any a, a modern supercomputer. Uh, we've been really focusing an interdisciplinary uh, approach. Uh, our team has combined nearly 400 million taxicab uh, rides in the city for the past several years, uh, combined with MTA and uh, train routes to model transportation uh, patterns, probably not unlike some of the data analysis we just saw. Uh, in the previous presentation. We've also provided data to show the solar energy available to the city of New York so that property uh, owners can potentially, you know, to understand the potential of solar impact. And we've calculated that for each of the 13 billion square feet that exist in the city. And our computer power was also used by the, the New York City for risk analysis and storm prevention in Mayor Bloomberg's report on New York City Special Initiative for a Building and Resilience. So many teams have modeled potential storm impact from North Carolina south. So if, so if you look on the map there that's before you, uh, traditionally we've thought of hurricanes as being something that, if, that impacts the Carolinas and Florida and down into the, the, the Caribbean. Uh, but we have the data in, in our system from the seafloor north of the Carolinas, especially for New York Harbor. And we've formed a uh, partnership with the uh, Renaissance Computing uh, Institute, RENSI, at the University of North Carolina, and that we feel that together we have the best combined data set about seafloor type, water depth, topography, atmospheric conditions, you know, the various kinds of things that impact the, you know, the very granular details of how that water is going to impact uh, when it comes uh, that, that comes ashore, and using our high performance, we can model vulnerable areas along the entire eastern seaboard. But of course, here in New York, what we're really interested in is uh, New York Harbor. Uh, after Irene in August 2011, the CSI team was concerned that many people were lulled into a false sense of security because of the eye track. You know, Irene's track, I'm not showing it here, but it was at, at the last minute, if you remember Hurricane Irene, the track turned and made a landfall quite a bit south of what was originally predicted, and the winds had died down, and it really was more of a rain and a, and a rain-induced flooding event. And in rain-induced flooding, uh, flooding generally happens slowly. Basements fill up, you know, very slowly with water over a number of hours unless uh, you know, the blue belts can't handle that storm surge runoff and you're, you're unfortunate enough to be in a home right in, in the path of a stream. Flooding was mostly very, very slow. And so people felt that, well, flooding from hurricanes is something that happens slowly. There's, you know, you can wait in your home until the last minute and then uh, get out as the water uh, slowly rises. But we were concerned that people weren't really uh, aware of what the onrush of a real storm surge flooding event would look like. So in June 2012, which was five months before Sandy, based on, uh, based on our computer modeling, uh, we wrote a, a, a paper that we presented at our a geological a professional conference that, that said that while most people don't think of New York as lying within the hurricane belt, powerful storms have impacted uh, the city before. And, uh, you know, Alan Benamoff has been doing years worth of field, uh, you know, basic field geology on Staten Island to really understand the history of storms on the island, but what we wanted to do was to really make it uh, visual for people so that we could model uh, what it would look like. So we sort of arbitrarily picked a 12-foot surge and we modeled a 12-foot surge, and we didn't, uh, we didn't predict Sandy, but the results of our model were, were, you know, really, really close, probably within a block or a half a block accuracy of what the actual uh, uh, Sandy event uh, looked like. So our initial model that we used was based on Hurricane Irene, and, and unlike some other models, we used the advanced circulation model, ADCIRC uh, numerical code, uh, rather than the slosh model, and we think that the ADCIRC uh, data better really handles the granularity as what happens in not just a, a, you know, a gentle rising and falling, but in the way that the, the water will be compressed uh, against the shoreline. And uh, following Superstorm Sandy, we then, of course, could refine our model because we had actual data from the storm that we could uh, enter into it. And so what we've been now doing in this process uh, is using hindsight uh, 
your hind casting simulation, and we feel that we can now arrive at surge simulations probably within six inches to a foot of the actual uh, uh, observed event. And this slide that you're looking at here is really, again, one just showing the New York Harbor. Uh, you know, I'd call attention to that right angle between the Jersey Shore and uh, the Long Island Shore and the, sh the rapidly shallowing water where you go from the dark blue to, to the light blue, you know, really acts as a ramp that, that compresses the energy, compresses the bulge, and really, uh, you know, squirts that water again against the, uh, the shore of Staten Island and then uh, pushes it up uh, New York Harbor. And of course, there's counterclockwise circulation from hurricanes, and so at the same time, water will be driven uh, westward along Long Island Sound, where, it, where again, it keeps the water from coming up the Hudson from escaping from Long Island Sound, and then that further uh, worsens the area, especially in you know, Battery Park and, uh, and, and here in Manhattan. So currently, uh, where, where we are in the process is uh, we're refining our uh, numerical grid. to better represent uh, the topography and the bathymetry, because the better that you can understand the, you know, the granular details of, of the topography, of the shoreline, of what the seafloor conditions are like, the better and more accurately uh, you, you can predict what that water is going to do. And, and again, I think the thing for the public to understand is we often think of water as not flowing uphill and you know, where water rises uh, slowly in a bathtub, but uh, storm surges are like, you know, taking your hand in the, in the bathtub and you can, you know, set up tremendous sloshes, s tremendous waves on the far side of the bathtub. And so it isn't just, you know, sea level gently rising and falling, it's really a compression of that energy against the shoreline. So again, uh, you know, we have massive uh, data sets to try to understand and uh, better, uh, better predict. And so, uh, this slide and then the, the next one are really showing, uh, you know, the detail. Again, this is the detail of the, uh, the shore of Staten Island, uh, you know, showing, you know, what this Sandy event looked like uh, using our, our numerical modeling. But of course, what we really want to do is to, is to understand and not just model Sandy, but we want to use that to predict what might happen in, in future events. And so we feel that, that we can now use this refined model to understand the effectiveness of various uh, flood mitigation uh, strategies. We're, we're in the process of, uh, you know, trying to look and trying within our, on our grid, placing in some artificial structures and see how those artificial structures might help or make the situation worse in terms of what an incoming uh, uh, storm surge would look like. Uh, the other thing that we're after that we think we're very uh, close to being able to do, but of course we're going to need the next event to be able to test our model, is uh, we're thinking of the, along with the expertise in forecasting from the uh, RENCI partners is, is that we're at the point of being able to do real-time predictions. So back in an earlier slide, I showed the track of Hurricane Sandy from when it uh, originated down in the Caribbean. And what we want to do for the next event is start plugging that data into our model so that we can start saying three to four days from now, this is what the storm surge might look like. And of course, that accuracy is going to be dependent on the meteorologist and the, you know, how the meteorologists are predicting, uh, projecting the eye track uh, of that hurricane. You know, in, in, in conclusion, though, what I'd say is, is we need to think more broadly using this type of approach than just a few days prediction of an actual event. I think sometimes the public is, you know, is looking for, you know, what's going to happen two or three days from now. But even with the best project, pro, you know, two or three days isn't going to save, you know, property and homes. Uh, you know, it might, it certainly would mitigate the, the loss of life and some of the, uh, the unfortunate tragedies that we had, but it isn't going to protect the property. And so I think the real important part of our study can be looking at the impact of how artificial structures that would be put, bioengine, you know, uh, uh, engineered reefs and, you know, other stu structures, and how is that going to change the dynamic uh, uh, of the water flow. Uh, you know, we're going to be hit again. Uh, you know, make no mistake, I talk to many people who say, oh, well, we survived Sandy, that's, you know, that, that's done and over, but sea level is rising, 
but even if you, even without sea level rising, just going historically, we know that in 1932 there was a, a hurricane of unknown strength that had at least a 15-foot surge, uh, based on our analysis of newspaper photos. And in 1938 there was an unnamed Category 3 hurricane. Sometimes it's called the Long Island Express that betrayed, that produced a surge on Staten Island of at least 20 feet, five feet higher than what uh, Sandy did. And uh, the reason that these storms went unnoticed, at least on Staten Island, but my guess is the other areas in New York as well, is, is they were, that was mostly undeveloped marshland. And when a storm surge happens on undeveloped marshland, you know, it's the old story of, does it, you know, the tree in the forest create a noise? <laughs> no, one's there to, you know, no one's there to hear it. The, the, surge, the surge goes unnoticed unless there's property and development and, uh, you know, creating the, the devastation that we saw uh, from Sandy. So uh, one thing uh, that, that we really think that I'm calling for, and again, using the science of the data analysis, I, I know this is, a, you know, I'm getting a little bit here into public planning and this is a, you know, a data conference, but I think what, I, what I'm really trying to stress is the importance of an interdisciplinary approach using big data analytics, field geology, urban planning, uh, you know, the sociologists and social workers of, uh, uh, of how, how can we convey uh, this type. And so I'm envisioning signage for the New York area that basically says to go to high ground. Uh, you know, people thought of storm surges as water slowly rising in their basement like in Irene. And at least on Staten Island, most of the loss of life were people going down in their basements, not realizing that you can't outrun a storm surge, that once the water starts to rise, you're, you're, you know, you're trapped in your basement. You have to, at, you know, at the first hint of, of that storm coming, you need to, like the little figure in the red triangle is doing, is, uh, you know, is running to safety. And the reason that I put the car in there, you know, not only was there the tragedy of 40-some uh, people killed in, in New York that, uh, on Staten Island, uh, and, and you know, very poor public transportation on Staten Island. If you don't own a car on Staten Island, you, you, you can't get to work. Uh, so tens of thousands of cars were lost. And so I'm calling for um, urban planning. There's two dark areas, a dark area and a blue area in the middle of Staten Island that are on high ground. Everything in green on that map. The good news in New York is we're not New Orleans. You know, in New Orleans, you have to go, you know, tens to hundreds of miles inland to find high ground. In New York, we've got lots of high ground, and, uh, you know, you only have to go a few blocks to find areas uh, that, that, are, that are safe. And so, you know, parking areas where people a day before the storm could take and leave their car, and some so, you know, even if your home is destroyed, at least if you have a car. I mean, it was a real tragedy on Staten Island uh, that, that people didn't have transportations. And uh, the five points that I've been talking about, we need to protect our uh, dune fields, our marshes, our wetlands, because the sim simulation show us, shows us, and, uh, uh, along with historical field work, that, that those are nature's way of protecting the, uh, the shoreland. Uh, we need to rebuild and restore our dune fields, especially along the Jersey Shore. There's many, many, you know, they're really actively uh, rebuilding and re-engineering uh, coastal dune fields, we need to consider uh, rezoning high-risk area. You know, when the governor uh, spoke on our uh, campus a few months ago, he said, you know, this, we just have to acknowledge that when you know, Mother Nature owns some of this property and when Mother Nature comes calling, there's not much we can do about it, even with the best simulation and, and the best engineering. And then we need to consider the appropriate use of seawalls and floodgates. And, and, you know, again, this is a progress report of what we're doing, but we're just at the point of starting to model, you know, what those engineering solutions would do as if they were actively there in place, because engineering solutions have, uh, you know, a history of uh, protecting one area at the expense of the other. So, you know, I'm just really uh, urging all New Yorkers to engage in this uh, conversation to include geologists, engineers, social sciences, counselors, political scientists, economists, community uh, planning, government agencies. I think this has to be something that all fits together. And I think big data analytics is, uh, you know, clearly a at the heart of driving how we can communicate that message. So thank you. I appreciate your time this morning.